Thank you everyone for joining us this Saturday on our webinar on a uh, lack of diversity in uh, machine learning or in data science in general and how we should be targeting to optimize the machine learning models. And by diversity, we are uh, meaning by uh, like in terms of women or uh, the different ethnicity or the race or um, in general, the socioeconomic backgrounds and how that creates like bias in models. So we are extremely honored to have with us uh, Dr. Valerie Bell. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we are extremely honored here at IDEAS and we welcome you. And uh, she is a computer computational social scientist, researcher, and a full-time analytics faculty member at the University of North Texas in the Masters of Science program in Digital Communication Analytics. She has a PhD in uh, sociology with a specialization in computer science, as well as statistics and advanced design and data analysis. She has a master's degree in social psychology and another in forensic psychology. And she has spent a decade in the industry as a marketing development manager, working with Fortune 500 companies to develop and launch new brands through innovative marketing strategies. She's also managed national product recalls and crisis communications for both international and national corporations and in extremely diverse fields like medical device, pneumatic superconductor and petrochemical industries. Uh, and she's from Chicago and a proud alumni of uh, University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign and uh, University of Nevada, uh, Reno. Thank you and we welcome you, Dr. Valerie. Uh, before we kick off the webinar, I would like to introduce IDEAS, our organization, to you all and what we do. So we are a nonprofit organization uh, and the International Data Engineering and Science Association. And our mission is to bridge the gap between academia and the industry. And um, we began our journey in 2016. And uh, so far, we have organized a couple of uh, conferences, data science conferences, blockchain hackathons. And we try to cover the fields of uh, data science, machine learning, uh, block science, and we try to bring in leaders from the industries and academia together, guiding the next generation towards empowering uh, in the fields of data science. And um, these are some glimpses from our Los Angeles Convention Center's uh, SoCal conference in 2018 and his uh, Chicago and New York Blockchain Leadership Connect, Pasadena Convention Center, again, a SoCal conference 2017, and then at USC. And um, as you see, we are pretty much spread out on the East and West Coast. We try to cover a lot of universities, giving students an opportunity to interact with uh, different leaders and learn from them and exchange knowledge. Um, again, some, some glimpses of a lot of events happening, and we have more of them coming. And if you want to know more about our organization, you can visit this website or connect us, uh, connect with us on different social media platforms. Uh, with that being said, uh, without any further ado, Dr. Valerie, uh, welcome again and please take over. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Anisha. And I also would like to thank everyone. I know there's people um, logged in and watching and listening from across the country in different time zones. I'm in the ten central time zone in Dallas and it's dark here. I understand if you're in California, you still got sunshine, but for the folks further east, it's probably really dark and really, really cold. So it is a Saturday night. So I thank you very much for taking the time uh, to log in and participate in this because as data scientists and analysts, this kind of issue that I'm going to talk about tonight is very, very important. And it's something that we're all aware of. Um, it's no secret, but as a social scientist, a computational social scientist, I bring the data and the people worlds together. And it's kind of a mission of mine that we bring those two worlds together, that we bring the people people and the data people together, because the goal for all of us is to have uh, better, a better society, better commerce, better education, and a better world. And when we bring those two domains together, people and data, there's no way we can lose. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and take it away here now. Let's see if we can get the sharing. Let's see here. And are you picking up 
Are you picking up my share? Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, so everyone should be able to see my screen now. Hopefully you can see it. But of course, the title of my presentation is Diversity, Inclusion, Optimizing Machine Learning Models. And of course, that also we know machine learning is part of artificial intelligence, is part of AI. Um, so basically what I'm talking about would apply to AI in general, not just machine learning, but we're going to make it a little bit more specific. Okay, so the first issue we have to talk about is the issues of where we are with data science and diversity. And let's look at the numbers, okay? The National Center for Women in Tech did a 2016 study that said that women comprise 26% of data professionals while I checked the most recent U.S. Census data that shows that women are 50.70% of the U.S. population. And when you look at the number of women in tech, that are also women of color, those numbers are even lower. In fact, they're less than 10%. So that puts them in the single digits. For men, um, men are 74% of data professionals, and yet they're actually less than 50%. They're actually a minority of the population. And if we look at ethnicity in general, sometimes what people call race, but it's really ethnicity, is that in data and tech, what we see is among professionals, it's majority white and Asian to the tune of 70% or higher, depending on which estimates you look at, which studies you look at, it's at least 70%. Sometimes it's higher, it has high as 80%. Um, if you look at the other uh, ethnic groups, such as Native American or American Indian, Lati Indian, Latino and Hispanic, and other smaller ethnic groups, combined all together, it's 30% or less. So what this tells us is that modelers are not representative of the populations they model. Now this is no big secret. Okay, so the question is how and why did we get here? Okay, well part of it is the fact that, and I have to say, this is not about blaming anybody. This is about what we can do to make better, more precise, accurate models. That's what this is about is that professors, CEOs, and society in general think that women and people of color don't want to be data scientists and they don't want to be in tech. And the fact is, is that stereotypes and biases that we have that are socially conditioned into us are responsible for these views. Things like, well, women should do certain things for a living. Women should be in non-STEM fields. Women are better in service fields because they're more nurturing. Uh, they're, they have more people skills. Uh, they're better communicators, but we just don't have the math and science skills. And that's simply not true. But what this does is it creates a lack of opportunity and it ends up in fewer pathways uh, to the field for those groups that, um, that are not stereotyped for success. So what this means is, is that positive stereotypes, in other words, men are designed or made or are, are better equipped for the STEM fields and Asians are stereotyped as being better in math and science. So they are positively stereotyped is what I'm talking about. And thus what we have is that women and people of color usually won't pursue the field. All right, so let's take a look at model making and, and what this has to do with it. And let's take a look at decision making. All right, so if we look at machine, machine learning decision making, as model builders, what we want to do is we want precision, okay? We want accuracy. We want usefulness. We want reliability. And we want validity because we are working with inputs, outputs, or both, and we need to be able to rely on those inputs, and we need to be able to trust our outputs. And we need to be able to use info and data to inform our modeling decisions. And of course, we need to be able to make inferences about our outputs, but these inferences are not done in a vacuum. Now, here where we come to what I like to call the invisible filter or the unseen filter. All right, this invisible filter affects daily decisions of all of us as we go throughout all our day in the social world. But it also affects our modeling decisions. 
And a process that we all go through, no matter where, what country we're born into, is a process of socialization. Social norms, which are written and unwritten, spoken and unspoken rules and guidelines for what is acceptable social behavior in the world. Laws, the media, institutions, social and governmental, and culture at large. They socialize us into perspectives that say, for example, Women are weak and men can't cry if they're real men. That criminals are all non-white and that poor people are lazy. Um, and that combines with something called social categorization, which is basically this cognitive shortcut that our brain uses to help us quickly negotiate and navigate our social world. Um, it's kind of like quick cognitive data processing, but in the social world. And what this does is it helps us auto sort people by sex, ethnicity, age, status, and on and on and on. Now, when you put socialization and social categorization together, what you get is explicit bias and implicit bias. Now, explicit bias is when someone just comes out and says, you know, I think this group is stupid. I think this group is never good at science. I think this group um, uh, never does this or always does that. In other words, you put, you put someone, all the members of a group, you paint them with a broad brush instead of looking at them as individuals. And explicit bias is something like let's face it, KKK members, the Ku Klux Klan members, who are very open, straightforward, and proud about their explicit biases. Now, we can deal with these because we can easily and readily observe them. But the more insidious thing, the more dangerous kinds of bias is what's known as implicit bias. This is the real problem because even people who um, are very progressive, they're very pro-diversity, all right, and they're in favor of diversity and in favor of women in STEM and people of color in STEM and that men, it's okay for men to cry and that people shouldn't be just all labeled and, and put into one basket. Um, even they have it. And there's the implicit association test that's been around for decades, has been, has been uh, shown to be exceedingly valid and reliable and it's been replicated repeatedly in all different kinds of circumstances. Now, the thing is that's good about this implicit bias is, we, is even though we all have implicit biases against groups to which we do not belong to. So as a female, I would have implicit biases against men. As a white person, I would have implicit biases against anyone who's not white. Okay, as someone that's a first generation working class person from that background, I would have implicit biases against anybody that's not in the working classes or didn't come from the working classes. These things are not fixed and we can get better. We can improve them, okay? So um, the reason why this is important in modeling and the impact that it has on modeling is that we make assumptions based on are implicit biases of which we have no idea because they're hidden, they're invisible, okay? And then as a result, what we do is we, those implicit hidden biases make us have assumptions about people or groups or different identities and we then interpret the outputs of our models, which of course in certain types of models later become the inputs of our models. We interpret those through this filter. And what we get as a result is flawed models, and therefore, we get flawed results. So let me give you an, three different examples that I was able to pull, and there are many, many, but I thought, you know, let's play around with a little bit of variety here. First of all, poor people only eat junk or fast food. Um, so what happens is if you're a company that is trying to market to people that buy healthy food and perhaps take vitamins or into a healthy lifestyle, What's going to happen is you're going to decide, you know what, these people, they don't, they're not into healthy food. They only eat junk food. They only eat fast food. Therefore, we're not even going to bother sending any of these people any coupons. We're not interested in their business. Now, the reality is this is simply not true. So as a result, 
The consequences are for your organization as you have overlooked an entire market. You have overlooked millions, millions of potential customers. And that means lost dollars for your organization. Or I'll give you another example. All women were meant to have babies. All right, so what that means is maybe your organization sends out coupons to women between the ages of 18 and 40 years. Well, that's simply not true. All women were not meant to have babies, okay? It's not true. So what happens is now your blanket assumptions based on your stereotypes have now resulted in you wasting money sending out coupons or even emails with coupons or tweeting coupons to people who were never going to need them or use them and you've also wasted time. And then my final example is, okay, non-whites and men don't do yoga and they don't do Pilates. That's simply not true, but it's a stereotype. So what happens is if you're a company that markets um, exercise wear or yoga mats or any kind of product related to these two uh, wellness activities, you have lost a major opportunity for big demographic reach and you've also lost money. So what this means is that in groups, that's the in groups are all the groups to which we belong. Like my in group is white. That's one in group to which I belong, but another in group is female. Okay, so when we're in our in-groups, so no matter what your in-group is, we make decisions about anybody who's in the out-group, which is anybody that's not us. So like I said before, my out-group would be men. My out-group would be anybody that's non-white. Um, so we make these decisions about people that are not like us based on these socialized implicit biases. Now, here's where it gets really risky and problematic and even dangerous because modelers have these bias because we're just like everybody else. We're human and we're all socialized. And what that means is, is that as we are creating more and more expansive AI systems, we will actually be teaching AI to replicate, not only replicate the biases that we have, but AI is gonna learn from our uh, rules of behavior what we do, especially neural networks. And what they're gonna do is those neural networks are gonna come up with new novel biases that never ever existed, and they're going to blanket apply them against millions and potentially billions of people. And this is the real reason why we need to pay attention is for what's coming very quickly. All right, so now, here's what we can do. Solutions, what I call action items. Now, I know I've broken the rule about how many, you're not supposed to have any more than seven to nine lines of text per slide, but you know what? Sometimes you just need to break the rules. You gotta do it when it's something important enough. You gotta think outside the box over here. Okay, so. Um, Cross-group mentoring. What we need to do is diversify the field of modelers, all right? And the fact is, men are not the enemy. Men are actually our best resource and our best teachers because they can best mentor underrepresented groups. And the reason why is that the fact is the groups of women are just too small. There's not enough women. And as you get higher and higher up in organizations, there's fewer and fewer women to help mentor and bring up other younger, earlier career women. Another reason why is actually a whole host of reasons is that men themselves design, control, and maintain institutions. It's a fact, it's been there throughout history. We might as well wake up and accept it instead of trying to deny it. Um, the fact is men, as being the ones that design, control, and maintain institutions, they also largely set the norms, they set the professional guidelines, and essentially define all the aspects of the field. Now they can best mentor by interacting with and learning from out groups. So men who mentor women 
is a wonderful thing and it's the optimal way to go. And white men that mentor, let's say, African American women or Latino women or Hispanic women or Native American, American Indian women or um, Hawaiian women is actually the best situation. Um, and uh, acclimatizing out groups, in other words, women and people of color to what I call the opportunity structure. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later what that is. Um, and also by setting examples for their colleagues, their superiors and subordinates. The fact is men set the norms for our society. So when, when men of influence model behavior, other men will follow. Now, mentoring from the protege side. So you younger folks, um, this is really for you, is that what you should do is keep your eyes and ears open for professionals that have what I call the mentoring mindset, all right? And these are those kinds of people you wanna look for. People that use innovative tools and techniques, people who are admired and well-respected as leaders and visionaries, okay? Because these are people that are not afraid to do what maybe other people are afraid to do. Uh, people who volunteer their time and efforts to teach and train, and people who are known to appreciate unique approaches and ideas. Also, ask around campus if you're a student, um, ask around your organization's office, and also your professional organizations are one of the best places to find mentors. When I was a graduate student um, with the American Statistical Association, I was part of the mentoring program, and I wouldn't be where I am today without that mentoring. Um, see who is open, and more importantly, who is available. Somebody may want to be a mentor, and they may be really fit to be a good mentor, but if they're very, very busy, they're not gonna have time for you, and you're gonna be cheated, and they're gonna feel like they didn't do right by you, right? Look for the people who love to talk, all right? Talkers love to mentor, okay? And as somebody who loves to talk and loves to mentor, I could certainly confirm that. Um, and also, ask around to see who can recommend someone. Um, and also, I think what's probably the most important thing is what I call the mentoring timeline. If you really want to be effective, be specific, okay? This is your career, your future at stake. Tell the mentor, just be direct, be open, honest, tell them what you want to learn and what you want to know. And set a deadline for accomplishing those goals of what you want to learn and what you want to know. Now, when those goals are met or the time is up, end it, all right? Because what happens is if the time deadline is up and you haven't learned everything you're supposed to know, what that means is you're not going to end the relationship, move on. Don't just stick with one mentor. You can learn from multiple mentors. I can tell you I've had multiple mentors throughout my business career and my academic career. And some were men and some were women. And some were from different ethnic groups, all different kinds of ethnic groups. Um, and that was a great benefit to me. But I learned something different from each of them. So it's very important to have multiple mentors over time. Now, for people that are senior in the profession, okay, scout tomorrow's professionals today. And the most important thing I can say to you folks is start exploring the unexpected environments. Everybody looks at MIT, Stanford, all the great top tier, tier one schools. Well, I'll tell you what, when you do that, you get the same people that all think the same way which means you all get the same solutions to the same problems and therefore potentially the same flaws and the same flawed model results. All right, now that's no disrespect to tier one schools whatsoever. I have degrees from tier one schools going back. So um, that's not the problem. We're talking about expanding our horizons and not cutting people out, but expanding and bringing more different kinds of people in. So look in the inner city and the low income working class communities. 
Look at the community centers. There's a lot of community centers that are starting up their own little tiny coding programs for kids, teaching kids how to do statistics, teaching kids things. There's kids now, six years old, learning Python, and you've got adults that can't learn it. So um, there's also library programs where they're doing this. And also because of the great app meetup, you've got ethnic groups meeting up and you've got women's groups meeting up. These are great places to look for talent. Okay. Um, also look for students and professionals in the social sciences who can bring what I call the social DNA insights to modeling. These are your people experts because remember at the end of the day, all these data are about people. We're trying to predict people's behavior, understand people's behavior, explain people's behavior. So do not overlook, overlook the people experts, okay? Now, when recruiting from colleges, explore graduates from the lower profile schools. And there's a really key reason why, is that when somebody comes from a program at one of these smaller schools or lesser status schools, they don't have the big budgets, the big endowments, that provide all these wonderful resources and labs and equipment. So what they have to do is to get the same quality education, and they do, they have to be creative. They have to really apply a unique thinking style and a new problem solving style because they haven't had these things and they don't have the infrastructure. They've got to overcome the lack of resources. All right, including the lack of a data science tech culture. So that means these people bring amazing insights and amazing problem solving skills that you never would have considered. All right, now build an infrastructure of opportunity. And this is all about finding people and creating pathways where it's easy for people to become data scientists and to be tech professionals. Identify promising talent early. And that is nurture um, with these, you can nurture um, early talent, promising talent with um, co-sponsoring education and junior internships for middle school kids and high school kids. If you have this co-sponsoring done by an organization, by a company, and by the community, if it's the city government or the county government or community center or or school groups or whatever, people wanna do this. They're very eager to do this. And when business and community get together, amazing things happen. So we need to do a lot more of this and we need to do a lot earlier. Now, if your organization doesn't have such a program, be the first to do it because there are tax benefits to your business. So you wanna do this. It's not just about about expanding the field and growing the field and having better modeling, um, there's also tax benefits, so that doesn't hurt. Except that basic gender and ethnic slash racial and class equality is a fact. Accept it, all right? We have to stop denying it. We have to stop saying it's not true. It's not about blaming anybody. It's about let's just accept it and move on. Okay, inequality shapes kids and college students' beliefs about what careers are possible for people like me. So if you're growing up in the inner city and you're a person of color or you're growing up rural poor or working class, you know college and education is important. You know the knowledge economy is important, but because you don't have any role models and the stereotypes and the socialization go against you, it's like a tide flowing against you like a tidal wave, you think it's not possible for you. You think I won't be treated fairly or nobody's gonna give me a chance even if I am talented and even if I am smart. Um, equal opportunity must be expanded. So community programs and junior internships will demonstrate that people like me can be a data scientist. People like me can be a coder or a programmer. Someone like me can be a web developer. I can be a statistician. I can be an analyst. Um, and it shows and it demonstrates that real opportunity and acceptance is possible. Now, in your organization and in the field, be prepared for growing pains because growth and change is painful and it's tough. 
all right? The dominant culture, which is just the way things are right now, they're going to feel threatened, all right? It's going to happen. We're all human, all right? Um, uh, some people are going to feel you're blaming the men, you're blaming whites, uh, you're blaming Asians. No, I'm not. We're just saying, what can we do to be better modelers, to have more accurate models? What can we do to have a better field, a better profession, where people can trust and rely on what we do? That's what this is about. This is not about finger pointing. We need to squash any emergent of what I call the victim subculture on either side. So we don't want the dominant culture to say, hey, um, you're blaming us for everything and you're forcing us into this and women are going to take over or we're going to lose our jobs. It's not like that at all, but it's a natural feeling. We also don't want the underrepresented groups of women and people of color to be saying, poor us, okay? We don't get the chance. The field doesn't want us because that's not true, okay? We want to squash the victim, so just squash it, all right? And the way you do that is you create an infrastructure that facilitates open, honest dialogue for everyone, whether you're the people that are already in place, part of the, part of the field already, part of the people that are the supervisors, the managers, the CEOs, um, or whether you're not, you're people trying to break in. We all need to be honest, talk about these things instead of sidestepping and saying, well, I'm worried about somebody's feelings getting hurt and I'm worried about somebody attacking me. You have to set up that infrastructure, that framework that says, listen, we're human, let's start from there. That's what we all have in common and we can talk about this. Let's work it out and see where everybody stands, all right? No excuse making, reject failure, right? Because things may get tough in your organization here or there, all right? So some people may say, you know, one little thing goes on and say, you know what, see, I knew it wouldn't work. This is just hippie stuff. It's not gonna happen. It was a big mistake. You gotta reject that attitude. Don't make excuses because it's better for all of us and more importantly, it's better for the field. Realize that everybody, we're all going to have to adjust, all right? Um, the people that are in place are going to have to adjust to the new environment and the new paradigm. And the people that are coming into this environment, you know, it's, it's not fun to be the first one. It's not fun to be in a field where you're the only one. In the business I was in, I was the only woman for a long time and it was very tough. I looked around and there were no other female faces in the room and it was really tough. I get phone calls, you know, let me talk to a man, honey. And I had to prove to them that I was competent, I was a professional, I knew what I was doing, all right? But at the same time, what we need to do is support and educate. We do not need and we cannot afford to coerce people, all right? Now, when you're looking at models and you're, you get results, all right, we know that implicit biases exist and those things inform how we interpret those results and make inferences and then recommendations, all right? So what we need to do is every time we look at a model, we need to start, we need to do what we do as scientists. If you were just a straight scientist, you know, studying geography or astrophysics or something, all right? Before you say X causes Y or this is the case, you must always consider alternate explanations. That's one of your safest bets. So if you're about to make an inference about people, stop and think, all right, why am I saying that this is the case? Why am I drawing this inference? Where are the data to support it? Not just the data I have, but data from other sources. And where do those data come from? And who collected those data? And how recent are those data? Always consider um, multiple explanations, alternative explanations. That's one of the safest ways to minimize the chances of your implicit bias helping you to make bad decisions, okay? or non-optimal decisions, all right? You wanna build work teams with diverse members of the population of interest, all right? 
So in other words, if you're studying um, middle class consumers, for example, okay, um, middle, the middle class is very diverse ethnically, all right? The middle class is not just white folks, all right? There's a variety of ethnic groups, all right? So what that means is, is that if you are modeling for the middle class in the United States, then you better have a very diverse team that represents those different ethnic groups from that population of interest. You should build work teams this way and you should do it very visibly. All right, you wanna show off, let everybody know what you're doing, show what you're doing, and you want to demonstrate the benefits of this very visibly. You also want to reward the successes of these diverse week te uh, work teams very visibly. Because what you're doing is you are breaking stereotypes and you are creating new norms in the field. All right, now, so let's talk about final thoughts. All right, what I call takeaway messages, all right? Now, again, this is not about pointing fingers and blaming anybody. This is our society. We got in it together, okay? Diversity and mentoring is aimed at infrastructure creators first. Men, men, you are our best resource, all right? You are our best teachers, and we can learn from you, and you can learn from us, okay? Um, it's, this is about creating a culture, all right? A culture where people think, they feel, they act, they interact with this same attitude. What can we do to build better models? This is about advancing the field. And really importantly, this is about getting an edge over the competition because you're gonna gain insights and data and opportunities they won't if they lack the initiative and the guts. And as we were talking about at the University of North Texas yesterday, our president, President Smatra said, the grit, the grit, you know, the gusto, the guts um, to do it. Now, the fact is, we all know that AI is rapidly expanding and that rapid expansion means that we need accurate, what I call minimal bias models for everybody's protection and well being. And we also need to integrate cultural concerns and cultural issues into our modeling paradigm. And again, this is not about pointing fingers, this is about being better modelers. And I thank you very much for participating. <laughs> Okay, now let's see if we can get the chat and see if there's any questions. Do we have any questions, folks? Any questions? Thank you, Professor, for a very passionate talk and uh, for elaborating on the implicit bias and how we take it for granted that the models are always unbiased and we always have an optimal solution. And I really like the fact how you focused on uh, ma taking men into uh, bridging this gap because uh, most of the feminist groups and all, they, they don't incorporate that kind of a spirit. So, so thank you for, for sharing that. And uh, everyone who is online, please feel free to ask questions you can type it on the chat uh, okay so we have a question from Corey Cohen uh, I, I apologize if I have mispronounced your name but uh, uh, so the question is what type of tools would you recommend okay well this Do is you a good tools in terms of uh, data science like well okay um, the thing is um, whatever tools you use are going to depend on things like what data you're trying to collect, what data you're trying to analyze, what, um, what you're modeling for, um, the questions you're asking, the nature of your inquiry. 
Um, and it also comes down to personal preference, you know, what you like. You know, there are a million for pay and open source tools out there or software as a service and open source tools out there. I personally, for web data and in particular things like social media data and internet data and customer review data and that sort of thing, um, I love Python. The learning curve is low. It's easy to understand. Um, it's extremely flexible. You can basically do everything. And I actually use Jupyter Notebook. And I love Jupyter Notebook. Um, it's actually a lot of fun and it makes using Python a lot easier. But it really does, de you're welcome. <laughs> it really does depend on what you want to do now. Um, my email contact information um, is available, and I'm at the University of North Texas, so all you have to do is Google Valerie Bell UNT, and you can easily find my page on the university website, the Mayborn School of Journalism. I'm a professor for the Master of Science a digital communication analytics program, which is a program that's about uh, almost two years old and it has taken off like you wouldn't believe. So we are very proud of that. And we are also extremely proud because our program is about 77% female. We are very excited about that. We're very proud of it. And also we are very ethnically diverse. We have um, Latina students, we have Hispanic students, we have a couple of African American students. Um, and um, so we have a student from India. So our, we have all different kinds of students. And of course we have uh, a Hispanic male. We have a couple of white males. So we've got a little bit of everybody. So we really want to be a model for the field of, you know, of diversifying the field. So if you want to learn great things like social media analytics and text analytics and um, all that kind of fun stuff, check out our website for digital communication analytics um, at uh, the University of North Texas Mayborn School of Journalism. Is that a shameless plug? <laughs> the, yeah, there's another question by Michael Ergosino. He says that uh, until the modeling fields diversity reaches a healthy level some years from now, and given how rapidly AI is evolving by the second, what can today's modelers do right now to minimize the bias? All right, that is a wonderful question. That's a great question. All right, well, what that goes back to is, um, is you should, everybody has like a workflow process when you're doing a model. Everybody's got their own, I mean, we have modeling paradigms that we've all learned in school when we've gone to workshops or um, uh, meetings or whatever and conferences. What you need to do is incorporate into your um, workflow a moment where you stop at certain points and think about where you can identify possible areas of bias. So example, you're looking at your inputs and let's say your inputs are various ethnic groups, okay? So you have like white, African-American and black, Latino and Hispanic and so forth, all right? Now what you should think about, depending on what your question is, think about, okay, what assumptions or beliefs might I have about these groups of people, about these populations, and just write them down. Just write them down. You can put them in the recycling, you can shred them or whatever, but write them down. No matter how bad you think they are, write them down. We all have them, we're human, okay? It's, it's not a bad thing to have them, it's a bad thing if you act on them. All right, so you should write those down. All right, so whenever you're looking at inputs, any things like gender, all right, you have male and female in a, in a model and you're gonna input gender into a model. Think about, okay, if I'm a man, what do I think about women? What are some of the beliefs I have about women? Okay, well, women just love to shop and all women wanna have a baby because their biological clock is ticking. 
you know, think about what are the stereotypes? What are the things that guys talk about in the gym, you know, or when guys are sitting at the bar or when they're watching, you know, whatever. I don't want to say football because that's a stereotype. If you say all men watch football, that my husband has no interest in sports. But whatever your leisure activity is and the guys are getting together with their friends, what are the things you say about women? What are the things you joke about? Because we joke about stereotypes and beliefs we have about groups that we're not a member of because it's kind of a way that we kind of sort of uh, express those um, implicit biases. So what you should do is write them down, even if it's only you doing it. But if you've got a modeling team group of people, start out when you're, you're doing your decision-making process. Okay, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna model? What inquiry or what project we're gonna do? All right, what are the inputs we're gonna look at or the variables? Okay, to start before we do any modeling, everybody, we're gonna sit around the table and everybody just take out a sheet of paper or take out your tablet and your stylus and just write, okay, for each of these demographic variables like race slash ethnicity, gender, social class, all right, or socioeconomic group, same thing, income group. What are the beliefs I have? What are the things I've heard other people say? Like poor people are lazy, all rich people are snobs and don't care about anybody but themselves. You know, all middle class people drive, uh, you know, crossovers and SUVs and they're all soccer moms, all right? Think about these things and have everybody write them down. All right, and then have everybody talk about them. Let's talk about them. And I'll bet you men in the room have some of the same stereotypes about women. Women in the room have some of the same stereotypes. They, women will share the same stereotypes about men because we are socialized into our gender roles. So we're given this baggage of the way we think we're supposed to be and the way we have to be and the limitations on us, just as men are socialized in conditions into the way they think they're supposed to be and what they can do and their own baggage, all right? So it's the same thing for ethnicity. So have everybody go around the room and let, just talk about it. Okay, well, how do you think this might affect our results or our decisions? Well, in the very least way, what it means is, is that this stuff is in the back of our mind and we don't even realize it. But when you start talking about it, those implicit biases become known and that's the first step in neutralizing them, okay? It's the same thing with your outputs, all right? If you have outputs, let's say about uh, socioeconomic status or income or ethnic group or whatever, or even things like age, Okay, when you get those outputs, do the same thing before you make your inferences, before you make your recommendations to stakeholders. Get everybody around the table and do the same thing, all right? What, what do we think about this group, all right? About this group that's the output. The same thing as you did in the beginning. If you do that, you're going to start to build a culture where you think about these things. And when you think about them and talk about them openly, instead of people thinking, oh, gosh, the, the guys are going to say that all women, you know, only care about purses and shoes, um, then they think that's going to start a fight. And the fact is, it's great to get these out because I guarantee you people are going to start laughing because you're gonna think some of these things are ridiculous, but these are deeply held beliefs that we are not aware of, and yet they inform our daily decisions when we least expect it. So that's what you can do. I Thank you, I hope, question. Michael, that answers your question. Um, and then we have um, Doa Muhammad asking, I'll just quote uh, straight away. I'm studying data science online. I have good background in math and I learned Python and Pandas, Matplotlib and NumPy. I'm starting to learn machine learning right now and uh, what I must do next. I think okay. it's in terms of career or 
All right, well, that's yeah. actually a good question. And, you know, as somebody who has taught a lot of things online, like statistics, for example, and even analytics, I can tell you um, that online has become a great resource for learning and skill building, and it's terrific. But one of the things you have is you start to feel isolated, like you're all by yourself. One of the best things you can do, I think, it, I hope it's pronounced Doa, I hope I'm not mispronouncing that, is use something like the meetup app and find other people in your area i guarantee you that there is a machine learning meetup group if you live in a major area there'll be others around you that are also in various stages of learning or expertise of machine learning you need to network with those people find those people and start going to the meetings because you know what they do at those meetings they do machine learning they do models they practice this stuff and you will learn amazing things and i've done it um that's one of the ways that i learned python is i never took a class in it i started playing with it on you know myself and then i went to a woman's python group here in dallas until i learned it women coders so um that's one of the best things you could do because you can also do a find a mentor there who can work with you and help you figure out not just what the next thing is to do but what the thing is after that to do and the thing is after that and the thing is after that and they can help you plot your educational and or career trajectory okay so that's what you want to do is you want to meet up with other people and that's a great way to do it Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. um, if there are no more questions, I, I want to ask you about uh, your, your career journey and how you decided to shift from industry to a, back to academia and how has it been for you? You want to talk about your <laughs> career okay. choices and well, because you have a really diverse background and it's very inspiring to people who want to change careers or want to pursue something else. Well, um, I always knew I was going to go to graduate school, but after I graduated from college, you know, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, Fighting Illini, um, uh, I went right into industry and I worked my way up over a decade to be a marketing development manager. Um, and I, I said, I was completely surrounded by men and there were no other women in that, at that level where I was at in that field. Um, but the thing is, money isn't always everything. And I was making a very, very good salary very early on. But the fact is, is that I am a people person, but I'm also the eternal student. And the fact is, is that there was something in me as an individual where I was always looking for something to study, no matter what it was. I had, you know, I would study as many of the technical manuals at work that I could, and I just couldn't get enough of it. But it wasn't really the right thing. I needed something more, and I made a decision that it was finally time for me to go to graduate school. I felt like I had grown up, I was mature, and I was ready. So I didn't go to graduate school until I was after 40. So for those of you who are non-traditional, who think I'm in my 30s or even 40s, and it's too late to go into data science or analytics, you're absolutely wrong. It is not, all right? Because actually, your peak, the smartest you'll ever be, the best functioning, the sharpest your mind will ever be, the best, the most analytical you ever be, is between the ages of 40 and 65. Most people mistakenly think little kids are super smart. No, they're just sponges, they absorb. But they cannot conceptualize. They can't do abstract um, thinking, all right? They can't do analytical thinking. They can just repeat things back and memorize things. That's not the same thing. So even if you're, even if you're older, it's not too late. Don't think it's too late. Um, it certainly isn't. And so I went, um, you know, really being really interested in people and in science, uh, you know, that's when I went into forensic psychology and then I went into social psychology because social psychology is what it is, is it's the power of the situation. All right, you put a person in a situation and you change the variables like the people around them, uh, 
the uh, uh, environment, what's happening, and then you look and see what people think, feel, uh, how they behave, how they interact. Um, and so uh, basically things like social media is social psychology online. So, um, which is why I got really interested in social media, social network, you know, social network analysis and social media uh, work. Um, and that, and in the internet and the, uh, the impact of technology and things like technophobia and machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. In fact, I just was on uh, two grant proposals related to artificial intelligence and machine, machine learning to the National Science Foundation uh, in uh, December and January about making machine learning and AI um, less biased, more fair, and more accurate. So this is a real interest of mine uh, going forward. It's something that's really important to me. So anybody that's interested in doing this kind of research and this kind of work, again, Google me, Valerie Bell, UNT, <laughs> and, and reach out. Or if you have any questions, you can certainly do that. But um, actually, I was working on my doctoral dissertation in, in computational sociology and at, um, at the Digital Analytics Association, of which I am a member, I was at a function, and they were doing a social media presentation that night, and I just got back from Boston University from an advanced uh, training intensive on social media analytics. And I said, wow, that's a topic I just literally just got back a few days ago from an intensive uh, program on this. And I actually met the dean of the Mayborn School of Journalism at UNT, um, who at that time was Dorothy Bland. She's now a professor uh, at UNT and the Mayborn School of Journalism that teaches race, media, and, and uh, or race, gender, and media, as a matter of fact. So she's very interested in diversity issues. And um, one thing led to another, and you know, it's, it's just a good example of the power of networking. So I had a job, and I hadn't even defended my dissertation yet, and I've been there ever since. So very happily. So. so. Wow, that's so inspiring. I'm sure you have inspired a lot of people through this webinar, and uh, you, your inbox is going to flood with a lot of people uh, asking you questions. And uh, please feel free to reach out, Professor Bell. And um, I think there are no more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Anybody that has any further questions, if you'd like to know, um, I don't put sources and citations in my presentations because I think they slow things down and then nobody looks them at the end anyway. But if anybody would like to know the sources of this uh, information, the content in my presentation, like I said, Google me, Valerie Bell UNT, and I'd be happy to email them to you. Or if you want to reach out and you have further questions or you want to talk about working on research together or a grant or something, by all means, please contact me. Thank you so much for your time and thank you, everyone. Oh, Go in line, I see you. there, Therese. Thank you very much. Go in line, I. Chi ha, cha ha ha ha. As we used to say, you should see my office. It's nothing but a giant. I have a six foot giant orange and blue eye that says Illinois, and I've got Illinois banners and pennants all over my office, but you can't see it because they're, you know, too high. But if you could, you would see that this is my line. I even have blue and orange furniture. <laughs> my office is the same way on campus, so yeah. I'm a very proud alum of the University of Illinois. I love it too, Joe. Wow, and <laughs> a lot of thanking, and everybody's loving it. I just have one more thing to say. Yes. As a UNT faculty member, go mean green. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, for Thank your you time, much. and have a fantastic weekend, everyone. Thank you. I'm just Thank going to you. float up a small poll, which is about how you got to know about the about this webinar and how you liked it. And uh, just going to take like three seconds. Please uh, fill that up and then. Thank you once again, everyone.
And I got a LinkedIn connect already. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right then, thank you guys. Have a fantastic weekend. And uh, thank you very much again, Professor Bell. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you Bye. very much. Bye-bye everybody, good night. Good night.